Our next lesson uh, concerns meditation six, and there are three points that I wish to bring out with regard to this meditation on this video. Uh, first of all, Descartes addresses the mind-body problem, and he presents what has become the classical model of understanding the mind-body relation in Western culture. Now, that does not mean there are not several problems with his position. Essentially, Descartes' position is referred to as interactionism. He takes a position that we refer to as dualism, that mind is a certain type of substance, mind our soul is a certain type of substance, and body is a different type of substance. Now that may seem to be a relatively natural sort of view. You have a body and you have a soul slash mind. Uh, but there, there are severe problems with taking this commonsensical or this very common view with regard to the mind-body problem. Because once you have two different types of substance, you have to explain how they interact. And the problem is, historically, nobody has ever been able to explain how a, a thinking stuff, a thinking substance uh, like the mind, can interact with a physical uh, substance like the body. So most contemporary philosophers have moved away from dualist positions. Now, Descartes' particular form of dualism is referred to as interactionism. This is that there's some true interaction between uh, the, uh, th the thinking stuff, the mind, and the body. Uh, when pressed about how they interact, Descartes revealed in his later essay uh, on, the passage, the, on the passions of the soul that the interaction took place via the pineal gland. Now, before you laugh, uh, it is not as ridiculous as it sounds. First of all, the pineal gland is the only part of the brain that is not split into left and right hemisphere. So Descartes reasoned, first of all, that consciousness is a single uh, unified sort of thing. It doesn't, it's not de uh, divisible. About this, contemporary brain science knows that he is mistaken, but let's pass on that point. Uh, and so when he looked at the brain, thinking consciousness was a, a unified whole, he could only find one part of the brain that was also unified, and that was the pineal gland. So he postulated, well, that must be where the soul resides. So essentially, if uh, I wish to do something like to raise my arm, what happens is I, uh, my soul sends uh, information to the pineal gland, which then sends it to the brain and the nervous system, which causes the arm to rise. Or if I feel pain in my arm, that would go via the nervous system to the brain and then to the pineal gland, which would then inform my soul that uh, that I am in pain and that I need to remove my my arm from whatever from whatever is the source of pain. Now, if you don't like uh, Descartes' view on this, if you don't like the idea that there's some sort of uh, true interaction via the pineal gland or in some sort of other way, what are other options? Well, they're not many. Uh, historically, uh, Nicholas Malbranche and Leibniz in the generation after Descartes presented interesting attempts at solutions to the mind-body problem. Uh, Malbranche developed a position that we refer to as occasionalism, where Malbranche argues that minds and bodies do not truly interact, they merely appear to interact. Uh, and the way that uh, the body moves in accord with the uh, with the mind is that God actually moves the body for you. It's a bit more complex than this. In fact, for Malbranche, what happens is that every particular moment, uh, the world ceases to exist and is remade in the following moment. Uh, the, the view can seem quite extraordinary when you look, first look at it. In fact, he, he borrows this ultimately from a Muslim philosopher, uh, Al-Ghazali. Uh, but the idea comes from applying atomism to time. So just as uh, matter comes in discrete uh, small chunks, so too does time. Time also comes in discrete small chunks. Now, once you do this, then each particular moment of time becomes a, ty a type of freeze frame. And then the following moment... Uh, is logically unconnected from the preceding, but God would take into account both the preceding physical state of the universe and the preceding mental state of all sentient beings in the universe in deciding what the subsequent uh, moment should look like. So you have these kind of freeze frames, and the next frame reflects both the mental and the physical aspects of, of, of a given moment. 
Now, this might remind you a little bit of a film where you'd have different frames of a film being logically unconnected. Uh, they're simply put together in such a way that they give the appearance of a flow, but there's no real necessity that one frame needs to resemble another. That comparison is not accidental. In fact, the first filmmakers uh, in the early 19th century were very influenced by the philosophy of Malbron. So, uh, if you, if you, if you, if you, with the description of occasionalism, if that makes you think of film, just turn it in the other direction. Uh, occasionalism inspired an under, uh, the creation of film, and so we we ended up developing uh, that way of having the illusion of uh, continuity when in fact there is not. Now, you may not like this solution either, basically that, that the world uh, disappears and is recreated at each different moment. It seems like a perfectly uh, extravagant doctrine. Let us try a third option, that of Leibniz. According to Leibniz, minds and bodies do not truly interact either. This is similar to Malbranche, but what happens is that bodies are following their own laws and minds are following their own laws, but they are in perfect harmony. Leibniz describes this position as pre-established harmony. So when God set up the universe from the beginning, essentially he set it up so that uh, psychological laws would accord perfectly with physical laws. So if I decide to raise my arm, my arm was simply going to go up in accord with the laws of physics. On the other hand, I also decide to raise it just at the moment it is going to go up, and this is going to occur in accord with, the, with psychological laws. Likewise, if I feel pain, and withdraw my arm. I already was going to, uh, that simply following psychological laws, that was going to occur. And then there's also the physical reaction, but these are in perfect harmony without a direct uh, causal connection. Now that may sound a little bit mysterious, but it's not all that complex. Uh, if you look at two different time pieces, they will tip, they should show the same time, yet there's no causal connection between the two. So likewise, minds and bodies can reflect one another because they are both reflecting a third reality. That third reality is God who placed them into perfect harmony. Now, if you don't like either of these solutions, well, then you probably have to give up either your mind or your body, because those are the three main dualist solutions. Now, we also have two very simple monist uh, solutions. There's actually three monist solutions. I'll simplify down to two. And this is simply to eliminate one side of the equation in one direction or the other. Uh, Bishop Barclay of the late uh, 17th and early 18th century developed the position of idolism, uh, which basically eliminates material bodies. This, again, can sound like a very extravagant position, but in the view of, of Barclay, the only thing that exists is mind. Uh, physical objects for Barclay are ideas in the mind of God. So they have a sort of continuity. We all interact with them, but we don't interact with them because they are real physical objects in a material world, rather because God is sending us all the same image. So the only thing that exists, only mental things exist, minds and the mind of God. Uh, all physical objects are types of ideas. Ultimately, they are not material objects. Most modern philosophers uh, also reject idealism as being a rather extravagant position, and this leaves us with, uh, with materialism, and materialism argues basically that mind is brain, and that everything is ultimately physical. There's only one type of stuff in the universe, it is material stuff, this could include states of energy of course, uh, but would not include a separate type of substance which would be similar to Descartes' thinking, thinking substance. Uh, this does handle a lot of mind-body interaction problems, but it leaves a few different cult things to explain. It's not an easy position to maintain, even if most philosophers think we can overcome the difficulties associated with the position. The strongest difficulty is how to explain phenomenal experience, uh, the way that we experience uh, the colors of the world and so forth, how exactly that occurs that we have these phenomenal experiences, uh, is still, with contemporary uh, uh, neurology, somewhat obscure. I'm going to break this video into two parts, uh, so let's put an end here to part one.